Hey everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode number 261. And today, I suppose, is a three-time iconic day as we change the co-host of the show. So we started with Anna, we then moved on to Rachel. Uh, I've been... Do- no, I haven't been off Rachel. We've just, <laughs> <laughs> we've just evolved the show into a new, different direction as Rachel moves on to Dubai and starts a sort of different phase of you know what she's doing with fitness. And we welcome Tom Bainbridge onto the show. Tom, hello. Hello, Ben. It's great to be here. Tom. I hope that Rachel didn't take it too personally because I feel really bad now. She took it very personally. She held it against <laughs> me for some time. Um, when I first uh, WhatsApped her, she texted me back and said, are you dumping me? <laughs> oh, nightmare. And I felt bad because I haven't dumped anyone in a while. I'm 30, you know. It's been a while since I played the dating game and sent one of those texts, you know. Oh, bit awkward this. <laughs> Doing all the texts never wise either, really, man. No, but when you're like 20, you don't think about that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, Tom, we need to give uh, people a little bit of background. Um, so, you work with us in Body Type Nutrition and Awesome Supplements. Your main thing is that you work in the academy. You look after the students. Uh, you're helping them with their education. You're building a lot of our resources in the background. You're writing books. You're doing all sorts of stuff. You're basically a key part of the brain in our operation. Um, so, you are a very valued member of what we do from a very from an educational perspective and if anything if this podcast is one thing it's educational or we try to be with a little bit of humor so tom what got you into fitness why are you here what happened well um i probably have the very very typical story that you'd hear from like a lot of fitness professionals in that I kind of, I wasn't the fit kid at school. I think you generally find that people who fall into the fitness industry have this background where it's like, oh, I wasn't the stereotypical in-shape child at school. So going through up until about age 14, I was the kid who during the summer would sit and play on the PlayStation and I'd eat a bunch of junk food and I got really fat towards sort of age 14, 15. Then... And the thing is as well, I grew up in a school in an area where really the only sport around is football. So if you were rubbish at football, you didn't do PE, you didn't do sport, you just didn't. Um, And then around 14, 15, we started doing rugby and PE. And I found out that because I was a bit taller than everyone, um, I've since stopped growing, but at the time I was taller than everyone. um, And I was way fat. I was actually quite good at rugby. So that kind of ignited some sort of interest. Um, I took up rugby, as is unusual on this podcast, um, but I did, I did unfortunately drop it around age 18 because I had to work and I couldn't make it to training, which was upsetting. Um, but yeah, so around sort of 14, 15, I, I got into sport, I ended up losing a lot of weight, I got really interested, I took sport at GCSE, I then went on and did it at college. Um, but then after that, as a lot of people who do sort of sport at college and things do, I fell out of the industry for a little while. Um, ended up because I'm in the northeast. I worked at the Nissan factory because that is just what we do around here. I think everybody in the northeast has either worked there or knows somebody that works there. Um, so I did my stint. Then unfortunately I fell quite ill, so I dropped down to somewhere around 65 kilos, which at my height, I mean, I'm only five foot ten, five foot eleven, so I'm not particularly tall, but it was it didn't look good. Like I wasn't well. Um, reignited my interest in, in fitness sort of throughout the recovery of that so I'm now as you said around 95 kilos so it's I'm, I'm about 50% heavier than I used to be um, so that kind of just shows you what the difference is um, but from there I have a friend who was on the TV show Gladiators the more recent version that no one actually watched um, he opened a supplement shop after he came back from his five minutes of fame asked me to work there because I knew a little bit about nutrition really and I needed a job so he didn't, it was kind of a low end thing but fortunately what that did is it gave me a lot of hours in the day where I was kind of stood on my own, didn't really have anything to do Mm. and for whatever reason I just got into reading about the products which then led into reading about nutrition in general Um, and I think I was just really fortunate in that I kind of have a mind for critical thinking in certain senses 
But also, I just think I was lucky to fall on reading the likes of Lyle McDonald, Alan Arrigan, Martin Birkin when he first sort of fell into the scene. Like, I read all of those guys instead of the less reputable sources. And it, I think it was more to luck than anything that I ended up actually knowing what I was talking about mm. to the point that people who came in the store eventually started asking me to coach them, like nutrition. Um, did that for a little while. Moved into the natural course of PT, which meant that I could coach more. I had, had more free time. I had more client interaction. Um, and then I believe I argued with you about something on social media. Yeah. We got on talking. We found that we actually agree on more things than anything. Um, and the rest is history, really. So The rest is history. I think that's a, an amazingly important point, is that me and Tom first bonded over a disagreement, you know, and we went at it in an amicable way on the internet. Like, we yeah. said, hang on, all right, I hear your point. And then we started to have messages between each other. And then we started to talk about it. And then we kind of ended up agreeing, but came from like a different angle. So Tom, you know, has a very different background to me in terms of how nutrition got him into, you know, just fitness and where he is at. I came from a kind of, um, you know, a kind of intolerance background, an overweight background. So it's still, we got inspired in the same place, but it, it kind of formed our different biases. And we, uh, we definitely talk about this a lot in our community about how our background forms our biases and kind of generally the angle that we tend to come from. Like I will look at certain things first in people and Tom will look at other things first in people purely because he values that area of nutrition because it's something that might have really helped him in the past and it, there's always going to be that connection there. Um, and I think the reason why I value Tom being around uh, me and our company so much is Tom acts as my sounding board and you know in fitness it's amazing because people do always think people just walk around with their opinions and kind of do what they want and the amount of time that the amount of kind of situations where me and Tom are talking about things like okay let's 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 look at this we're, we're teaching this in the academy like why are we talking about it? What's the different angles? What do we need to consider? What does the research say? Do we completely agree with the research? Do we think the research lacks some context in certain populations or hasn't really explored certain areas enough? And I think, if anything, for the podcast moving forward, to have more of a critical thinking angle and kind of a link to the research to some degree with the podcast is only going to be a new kind of uh, just angle for the podcast more than anything and i think tom has a lot of value to bring the show <laughs> on with the show yeah i think it's just really the way our relationship generally works is because we're both very open with each other and it is it's amicable disagreement and open discussion where nobody just decides to call the other one a dickhead and then go and do something else which is generally how it works on the internet and i think especially within nutrition everyone agrees on like almost everything and we just find the little minutiae to disagree on and because we do have that ability to converse about things we always end up finding oh yeah we agree just this little detail you view it like that i view it like that mm. it's yeah it's, and it, I, I've, I've talked about this kind of topic quite a lot this week because i've been on the road teaching a lot and obviously the the discussion of context in nutrition is is very important it's always going to come up and you know when you're a coach, one of the key skills you have to have as a coach is you have to put yourself in that person's shoes. Like what life is that person walking emotionally, financially, spiritually, uh, just everything. You've got to understand their environment. And, you know, when I think about my background with what I suffered from a health perspective, Tom will never truly understand what that feels like because he's just no. never been there. He'll try and understand it and try and think about... Um, the emotions that I might have gone through and it's the same I will never truly experience what Tom has gone through with you know what he classifies as being ill and, and having those problems and you know it's my job to sit down with Tom and say Tom this is what it feels like this is what kind of happens this is what you sort of live with and this is what empowered me with my view now and Tom would do the same like this is the kind of place I was in. This is the thought process that I would have. And I have to stand back and whether I can truly visualize that, I just have to appreciate that, that that is a legitimate set of human emotions that shapes a person's character and belief in certain systems and thinking. 
Yeah, I mean, there are objective truths and then there are subjective truths. And I think provided no one takes it as the subjective truth overriding the objective one, I think that's where discussions can lie. So should this person eat like X or Y? And it's like, well, you need to work out, do they follow the things that we objectively know? And then if both approaches do, so calorie balance, for example, um, adequate protein intake, adequate fruit and vegetable intake, all of those basic things. If an approach accounts for all of the objective knowledge that we sort of have around nutrition, then that's when the subjective right, okay, so maybe if they do this or maybe if they do that, they're both still fitting into what the research says, what we know about nutrition, what we know about biology, but it is then having that extra little facet, and that's why you say it's where the biases come in. I would never eat in the way that you often promote, but then that doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. It means that I wouldn't eat in the way that you promote. However, the way that you promote would still, like to certain clients, I mean, um, that still does meet all of those criteria. Mm-hmm. Myself, the way I would approach it, it still fits all of those criteria, but it wouldn't fit in with your specific approach. That is why there's more than one fitness coach in the world, because we're not all promoting the same thing. Mm-hmm. So. so, with that topic in mind, we should probably mm-hmm. delve in to a user's question where we can maybe mm-hmm. open up some debate. Uh, we've got two questions for today's show. One is going to be around a liquid nutrition, and the other one I can't remember. But when you read it, <laughs> I'll remember. Oh, yes. before we go into that, have you watched Eddie Hall's documentary? I haven't, no. On Netflix. I'd recommend it. I'm only, I'll am only i be honest, I'm only about 30 minutes in, but it's really good. No, I, I like a lot of the content he puts out, actually. Um, I think the only documentaries I've seen on Netflix are some... Um, I've watched both of the CrossFit ones, um, all of the animal ones, obviously, um, <laughs> and I can't remember which one I've watched. It might have been Forks Over Knives or one of those ones that I keep getting linked to, just so I could thoroughly disagree with it properly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if other pe- if people want more Netflix recommendations, I really like the the new Minimalist documentary as well. That's good. Oh, are they the guys who live with as little stuff as possible? Yeah, kind of, yeah. Yeah, they just basically promote a life of meaning over stuff. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Great philosophy. All right, then. On with the show, Tom. You're the new cool. co-host. We, we will start nice to him. number one. I Well, number one is always a good place to start. Cool. So, the question is, hey, Ben. Love the podcast, especially hearing you both yelling, eat more fucking calories, as the answer to 50% of the questions asked. To clarify, I will also usually have that response. (laughs) I know how you feel about companies like Herbalife and eating real food, but I was wondering if you had anything to say about more reputable, nutritionally complete meal replacement companies. Companies like Rosa Labs or Joyland are more mainstream. I believe they're two USA brands. Mm. But there are many smaller companies like Huel in the UK, that focus on higher quality ingredients. I find this space fascinating and love trying out new products. For the past two years, about 40 to 100% of my daily calories have come in some form of Lent, as they're sometimes called. As a busy single girl in an American city without a car, prepping three healthy meals per day would take a huge amount of time and effort normally. Being able to nail down my calories, macros and micros by mixing some powder for breakfast and lunch really helps me focus on cooking higher quality dinners and feel comfortable knowing I'll still have my numbers consistently when going out with friends. I think Alex at Superbody Fuel would be a fascinating podcast guest since he is so super geeky about nutrition and food intolerances. And thanks and keep up the awesome work. So this is obviously a fascinating topic and at no point do I not think liquid nutrition has a place in our diet. I think it does. Um, but to work with a client to know that they potentially some days get 100% of their daily calorie intake from liquid, well, I'm going to argue that I don't feel it's ideal. Now, there's obviously basic macro and micronutrients. And then after that, we've got to look at all the other things that we often get from fruits and vegetables or energy dense food, the different cofactors. Um, something that you're probably not going to get is kind of like pre and probiotics. And when we look at the quality, We've also got to be, I suppose, very critical at looking at quality and how someone is quantifying quality. So, for example, um, 
What is the lady's name? Oh, we don't have it. Okay. We don't have a name, no. We don't have a name. So she says that Huel is in the UK and they focus on higher quality ingredients. How do we know that? Did they just say that? Did they just say that we use great ingredients? Because as far as I know, they use soy as their protein source. And we could maybe argue that that's potentially not as good as a protein source as something like whey. um, And quite often has a high link to genetically modified foods. Whether it's GM free or not, I do not know. I will be honest. But we obviously need to look at the overall health of the diet. Now, if I had a client that's on Huel, I'm probably going to say, do you know what? Can you get up in the morning and mix some frozen berries, some whey protein, a bit of nut butter, lengthen it with a bit of milk, and even if you made two or three meals worth and made like a massive tub, that is going to have you know a bit more in it. Maybe it doesn't have all the micronutrients because Huel are kind of looking at all the micronutrients and saying, right, we're going to put everything in it, but we're going to get more good stuff in there. There's going to be more fiber in there as well. Um, so I think it's kind of a, it's a very open-ended com- conversation. And when we look at the context, we have to, I suppose, really look at the alternative. For this person, what is the alternative? If the alternative is grabbing a slice of toast, a sandwich on the go, and literally grabbing whatever for dinner, then actually this is a better alternative, despite the fact that we will argue that it's not optimal. So we've got to keep that kind of thing in mind. Like we could say that liquid nutrition as a whole is not as good as real food. So we will promote that as a healthcare practitioner, but the alternative might be that someone is way off the mark. (coughs) We're kind of saying, well, it's kind of okay. No, I know know where you're coming from with that. I mean, I've got the, like I managed to pull up if I've lost them, no, that's annoying. There, I've managed to pull up all of the contents of the three products. So we've got the Rosa Labs product is called Silent, which just puts me off straight away. Have you seen that film? Um, I'm not sure. Oh, it's I believe it's like a futuristic setting where everything's provided and they get fed Silent, which is made out of people. Um, it's made out of people. Yeah, it's like recycled humans, and then the end. The one of the end scene is like someone goes crazy and starts shouting, "Silent is made of people," or "Silent is people," or something. So nice. yeah, I don't know why they picked that name. <laughs> um, but I mean the the Rosa Labs one, so the silent one, kind of along with what you're saying. There's not a great deal of fiber in there. You get three grams per serving. They recommend four per day, so you're looking at like twelve grams of fiber per day. Like that's not great. Um, that one, the main protein, I believe, is yes. So you're right. So on that one, the main protein, soy, which it's not the worst thing you can have. Like it's not going to kill you. But if your only protein source is soy, that's not ideal. Um, and I also can't see any omega three in there either, which is not a very good thing if you're basically avoiding that every day. Because mm-hmm. the idea of these products is that you could literally live off them. So I'm kind of approaching it from that angle. Then we've got the Joyland one, basically the same crap, but they use whey protein. So their protein content's a little higher per day. These ones, this one does have omega-3, although it does come from flaxseed, which doesn't work quite as well. Flaxseed's quite high in ALA, which needs to be converted into DHA and EPA to be useful. And the, like the conversion's terrible, so you're not getting as much omega-3 as you would ideally do. Um, and then when you look at Huel, their proteins from pea and brown rice, which is pretty good. Um, they've got flaxseed again, which is a problem, but they've also, well, not a problem, but it's not ideal. Um, then they've got MCT powder and stuff. So realistically, the, the three products, which it, it's kind of mostly the same, slight variations, I would say, of the three Huel's a preferable one. But really, it, it does come down to what you say. It's like, is that ideal? And is it ideal comes down to what is the alternative. So, yeah, as you say, if, if if it's this or toast, then go with this. But realistically, could you opt for a better sort of alternative that perhaps you've made yourself and would cost a lot less money? Um, what it just brought me off, What it started me thinking of, though, was a quote by Michael Pollan in his book, the name of which escapes me, where he starts talking about nutritionism, which in his in his eyes is this philosophy that we have. Because 
we've now got a lot of science around the topic of nutrition and because we understand a lot of nutrition we know the constituent parts of things so we know the macronutrients the micronutrients we've identified a lot of phytonutrients and all those other different things in things it then starts us thinking that right okay the only benefit that you get from food is due to these nutritional parts and that's kind of where these these products are kind of the logical conclusion of that form of thinking now there's two basic problems with that the first one is food isn't just fuel so we enjoy food we eat it for pleasure we eat it for socialization it forms a massive part of our culture and if the idea of these products is that you would just literally subsist off them all of the time we're kind of going to lose some of that I mean, the kitchen's the heart of the home. We have all of these little phrases that are quite quaint, but they, they came from somewhere and they've got a point. Um, and the second thing is nutrition science isn't complete yet. So I think it's a little bit hasty for a company to say, right, this product contains everything that you need, because mm. we don't know that it does. We All it does is it contains everything that we currently know that you need. And there's probably going to be gaps in our logic. There's gaps in our logic with everything else. So although... Nutritional science has got like a hell of a lot to add to the conversation, and as I mentioned in, like earlier, we really shouldn't stray too far away from it. I think to believe that nutritional science is so complete that we can literally feed people using it, as opposed to using actual foods, is probably a bit of a mistake. Um, for me, end, pro end point is if this girl's having one, maybe two meals per day using this. It's not ideal, um, but over the short term, it's probably not the worst thing. Um, I wouldn't mind if products like this were used as sort of aid for disaster areas or something. Like, people can survive on this, but I would think there's a difference between surviving and thriving. And I would say if your time is that little that you're unable to sort of create whole food meals, if you're unable to create something that's tasty, because I can't imagine these taste that good. I mean, that is a complete assumption and I could be totally wrong, but I can't imagine drinking some sort of vague, milky thing twice a day, every day for the rest of the time. Like, that's just not going to fly. I think if you don't have enough time to make anything other than what is basically a milkshake, um, it could just be time to assess, like, where your time is going. Like, if you're a busy executive or a busy up-and-coming executive, you're working 18 hours a day, fair enough. But if that's not you and you can spot other areas in your life where maybe you could shave 10 minutes off, maybe that's a 10 minutes where you could be getting some whole food nutrition that may benefit you a little more. Mm. Uh, just to round off this topic, you pulled up, because we talked about this before we went on air, you pulled up the re latest research comparing um, whole food against liquid nutrition. And what did it conclude? Yeah, so this is a paper from... Uh, January 2008 in the Journal of Hormones and Metabolism Research um, it is entitled Effects of Solid versus Liquid Meal Replacement Products of Similar Energy Content on Hunger, Satiety and Appetite Regulating Hormones in Older Adults. So what they're doing here is they're basically they're replacing meals with products. One of them is a liquid and one of them is a solid. Um, and basically what they found is that although... Some aspects of hunger control, so leptin would be the one that people have heard of. Leptin, the difference was in, was not there in between the two products. Um, but the liquid product resulted in higher levels of hunger. So subjective hunger was experienced more after the liquid meal. Um, and also there was differences in insulin and ghrelin secretion, which kind of correlate with increased hunger and increased appetite. So that would kind of play into, if someone was considering dieting in this way if someone was considering eating in this way you need to bear in mind that you are potentially going to be hungrier and because of the bland taste of the foods and the fact that you haven't actually got to chew anything i mean mouthfeel is a massive part of appetite and mm. um, it's one of the reasons why fatty foods are so satiated and i mean there's a million reasons but it's one of them um because taste mouthfeel and as we just mentioned various hormones and stuff to do with appetite are so important if you are intending to pr replace your meals with a meal replacement product long term you might find that you're going to struggle with adherence and you might find that your appetite and stuff is going to lead you to ultimately overeating so it's not an approach i would recommend long term but in fairness these companies have done their homework and for a short period of time if you're stuck between this and toast then it's probably the better option Mm. Not that I'm bagging on toast, obviously. Of course not. Uh, with Marmite <laughs> on top, of course. Are you a lover or a hater, Marmite? 
I'm a lover of Marmite as long as you don't put butter on as well. That's just a sin. I don't understand why people do that. Well, you've got to have a bit of moistness somehow, haven't you? No, that just takes away from the mar- it takes away from the marmitiness. That's the, you just put more marmite. I'm going to agree completely. We've just fallen out oh. already. No, just put more marmite on. If, if, if your toast is dry, you're you're in a state of insufficient marmite. I think uh, what and I don't. I'll be honest. I haven't looked at all the ethical components of the companies that do promote these meal replacement shakes, especially um, Huel. I obviously know a lot about Herbalife and Juice Plus. Um, and I will stand corrected that Huel is not soy. You said it was pea and rice? Yes, pea and rice. So I'll stand corrected there. Um, you know, what, what some of the big beef that I've had over the years against companies like Herbalife and stuff is that there's not this true educational process. Like, if we, like right now, we're saying, look, if someone wanted to use a product like this to help lose weight, then actually it's probably going to be a product that will help lose weight. But what is going to happen off the back end of that? Are they going to have the education to transfer into actual cooking skills dietary management weight management if that doesn't ever happen then nothing has really changed that person hasn't become empowered they've just used something to create an effect which is obviously going to be healthy because weight loss is good uh you're gonna you're gonna get an improvement in health markers but we need a bigger picture we need education we need life skills because for me teaching people about what goes in our mouth is a nutritional life skill it empowers us to control health and weight long term. And for me, that's really what's missing with these products. Like, I'll stand here and say whey protein, you know, many people see it as a really valuable part of their diet. Awesome. But it's not any more, you know, different to a chicken breast. It is just a liquid form of protein. It's just something that serves a purpose. And we need to know the purpose of that and use it in the appropriate context with the right kind of uh, belief and information behind using it in that way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the Huel thing, one thing that I will say about Huel that's like, in my opinion, quite valid, is that they talk on their website not about weight loss or anything like that. They they kind of promote it as a sustainable way of eating, which I already said I kind of disagree with the the idea that this is complete. I think, if anything, that's quite... Naive? <laughs> arrogant <laughs> um, not necessarily on the not necessarily on the part of Huel or the company behind them but just on on the part of nutrition as an industry I think it's quite arrogant to think that we understand everything about nutrition already mm. if that makes sense um, but they promote about the idea of the amount of food waste that there is um, the amount of people around the world who are who don't have enough to eat and products like this could be not the solution but a part of a solution and I think that's I think it's a valid argument. Mm. I don't. I don't know how it would actually fit in. I don't know how it would work. There's distribution and everything, but yeah, it's it's a valid point. I think the salt of that might uh, kind of come in the future. In that, if Huel, let's say, release a product in eighteen months' time, and let's say it's called Huel Two Point Oh, and mm-hmm. they say, okay. We said we thought this was complete, but actually new research has emerged. We now know that this, this, and this is important. Our product was inferior in this. We've looked at the research and we've responded. It's like you you and me, at least, what, 18 months ago, built our product Awesome Daily Dose. And we looked at the product and we and looked at the research and we said, right, what does the human body typically lack? Vitamin D, uh, fish oil, magnesium, bit of zinc, and kind of a low-level uh, multivitamin. We'll periodically look at that and go, right, is the research telling us something different? Do we need to change it? Because we are the ones that really did it to improve uh, improve our health and make sure that all the health bases are covered. And it's within our interest to actually have a product that does all of that and then promote that for the right kind of reasons. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've got a document on my computer that I won't pull up because it's the most boring document ever. Um, But it was created at a UN conference a while ago, and they revised all of the RDAs, or RNIs, um, and they all went up, and it's just basically because the criteria for deficiency, the criteria for what constitutes the amount of nutrient that you need changed, and and I think that's not going to be the last time that happens, Mm. so. I think that's generally why, you know, when I'm coaching clients, and I'm really just putting the message of health out, I always say, Look, if you can eat as many vegetables and fruits as humanly possible within your daily calorie allowance, I believe you will be healthier. If you can eat 8 over 6 or 10 over 8 or 12 over 10, there's going to be an increased benefit because you're just going to have more cool stuff 
that the body's going to go, mm, 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 mm. use that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's definitely going to be sort of diminishing returns. I mean, the recommendation was recently increased to 800 grams or 10 portions of fruit or veg per day. I don't remember which body that was. It was probably the WHO. Um, and I think there is definitely an argument that you don't get extra credit for taking in more than you need. At the same time, I just don't think it's completely 100% defined how much you do need. And I think any nutrition person who doesn't recommend, obviously there's going to be context to which this doesn't apply, but who doesn't recommend in general eat as many fruits and vegetables as you can realistically fit within your within your daily intake around other foods, ensuring obviously you, you get enough protein and all that. I think that's a mistake to not recommend that. Like I don't understand why anyone would say, oh, don't bother eating broccoli today. You had it yesterday. You can just have some sweets instead. <laughs> like, but yeah. And I think this is where arguments are always going to occur because, well, not arguments, a difference of opinion because we, we don't know that ideal level until we get like the watch on our wrist that says, well done, you've reached your 100% of whatever today by eating X, Y, and Z. We're never going to know if you need to eat X amount of blueberries, X amount of broccoli, X amount of this, because it, it just doesn't really work like that. So we, that's why we, we look at the research and we make best guesses, come back to Awesome Daily Dose as a product. We say, well, we kind of think that if someone took a baseline two grams of fish oil a day, it would be a very good step to improving or maintaining all of the health markers that that looks to act on. And we'll, we'll look at that with every nutrient. Um, and I suppose... Actually, I want to get a little bit salty for a minute. I want to get a little bit angry, actually, because I was looking at this on Instagram this morning. Um, I can't remember what I was searching, but basically I went through a couple of Instagrammers um, fitness profiles and you could tell that they were very if it fits your macros based. Mm -hmm. And my big dis disagreement with that side of the community is that I very rarely see like recipes where they're talking about guess what, I just fit five fruit and vegetables into 300 calories. It's usually, look how much shit I ate in 500 calories, and it's all made pretty, and it's got zero calorie sources all over it, and I'm like, I'm all for that. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for, you know, getting a bit of what you want in, managing a healthy lifestyle, all of that stuff. But when you look through someone's Instagram profile, and it's burger, pancake, like and there's literally no vegetable. I'm like, where is that health care, health promotion? To me, it's not. Yeah, no, I think. I mean, I am a big fan of flexible dieting and and all of that. I recommend it to clients. I do it myself. But I think there needs to be. There, I think there is a disconnect between the message that is promoted and the message that is actually. Well, and the approach that's actually being used, I mean, you're right, you do look through Instagram. I think this is a fault with Instagram, though. You look through Instagram and all you see is you'll see the cakes, you'll see the biscuits, you'll see um, milkshakes that have got cream and biscuits and shit on the top. And that person has fit that into a day that is, or that is basically surrounded by chicken breast and broccoli and fish and all of these really healthy foods, they're probably still eating seven, eight portions of vegetables a day, but they don't promote that. And the thing is, the evidence-based fitness community that really can understand the context of that constitutes a really small minority of people on Instagram. So the majority of people are seeing that, and they don't necessarily know the other side. I think there's a few people who have started to sort of clock onto this and promote the idea that they do eat apples and, and other snacks that aren't just like, kids party food um but it's an idea that needs to be promoted more i think because i mean even the most ardent of flexible diet will probably a generally healthy diet and in fairness they're probably going to be healthy could they be healthier maybe but i don't think there's any way to actually quantify whether they would or not no. but i think people who are in shape in the sort of in the world that we're in which has an obesity epidemic and diabetes epidemic I suppose that is as well um, I think some element of responsibility would be wise I mean I'm not preaching to people I don't want to tell people what to do like do what the hell you want but I think it's wise to maybe mention the context in which things are so that it doesn't appear that you only eat biscuits and that the idea that people get 
isn't, oh, you can be healthy and eat this stuff all the time, rather than you can be healthy and eat this stuff relatively regularly in the context of an otherwise balanced diet. I know it doesn't fit so well into an Instagram post, but that's well, the way that it is. The reason why this got me salty is because there was a photo of a guy's daily intake. So he'd been mm-hmm. to the shop and bought his day's food, and it had a Pepsi Max, cheese McCoys, a packet of chicken fridge raiders, two sandwiches, it had some form of sweets, and there was literally not a single vegetable or fruit in that. And I yeah. was like, dude, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I can't... For me, that's Reddit, like... And, and there was no context given. There was no, like... You know, this is in the, the balance, the grand scheme of things. You know, there was no like, you know, I was on the road and couldn't get to any fruit or vegetables today. Like on Instagram stories at the moment, I'm kind of documenting a lot of the things that I'm eating on the road. And I'm showing people like, yeah, I ate three sandwiches today, but I tried to make breakfast. Like I grabbed breakfast and I had a big bowl of fruit salad. And when I'm home, I'm eating like loads of fruit and veg because I almost want to kind of like offset the fact that yeah. I've not really had a lot of good stuff for the last two days. And I the reason why I look at that as well is I like I'm like and this is my bias. If I ate that as a day's food, I would feel so unfulfilled. I would literally mm. get to the end of the day and gone, I haven't even tasted like an actual real flavour. I haven't <laughs> I don't feel like a vitamin has gone into my mouth from eating crisps. You know, just, you yeah. know I don't mind eating a bit of that stuff, but like there's no fulfilment there. I just don't get it. Anyway, yeah, yeah I'm getting too angry. No, I do think I, I'm, I'm you. Do you do you? Um, whoever is the post of that picture, I hope they're happy. I hope they're fulfilled. They can do whatever the hell they want. It's fine. It's their prerogative. I just think that when the fitness, the health and fitness industry gets too far towards that side of things, I think we start to dilute our message. And then when those same people will complain. Or not even complain, but they will lament the fact that we do have health crises in the country. It's like you're not helping. Like fair enough. If your if your goal with that photo is to show other people within the health and fitness community that you don't have to subsist of chicken breast, rice, and broccoli, mm-hmm. then fair enough. You've achieved your goal. But I think often it's done more of like a brag. It's like, oh look at all of these things I can fit in, mm-hmm. and it's like I hate to tell like flexible dieters and stuff but people on slimming world do that as well like you get people who post pictures of treat plates yeah. and it's a plate it's a plate and it's got like some freddles and some snack bars and some other bits of shit and it's like you've fallen into the exact same trap i mean we could talk on this for hours so we probably shouldn't we'll bring it up another time <laughs> but yeah i just think that as a responsible health and fitness professional it's a wise idea to promote balance and balance isn't just the shit that you eat like it's the good stuff that you eat as well like you can't load all of the information on one side of the seesaw and expect it to balance Mm. i think the other thing that annoys me as well is it ends up becoming a form of elitism and these people sometimes these people become arrogant with it and it's kind of like look at me i'm in incredible shape i'm eating shit you're eating shit but i look better than you so if you just basically eat a bit less and control your calories, you'll be as good as me. And there's that kind of that air of like fitness arrogance. And I just, again, it's not something that I want to see in the fitness industry. I want to see that, you know, people are all talking about health and people are looking at the widest spread issue, which you've brought up a lot. And the widest spread issue is, is that we have widespread, massive crises in terms of diet related conditions type 2 diabetes, people being chronically overweight, you know, all sorts of other disorders that are connected to a, you know, we'll call it malnutrition while still being in a um, hypercaloric state, which is kind of a fucked up place to be in. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the points you brought up just there was quite good as well, it's the whole, um, if you could just eat a little bit less and control the amount of those things that you eat, then you would look just like me and while that's objectively true, subjectively that's not possible for a lot of people, it takes a certain person to be able to eat half of a chocolate bar on top of their oats and then put the other half back in the fridge. I think some people do, as part of their bias, have this idea that it's 
it's that people just eat too big portions because they want to, and if they realise that they could just weigh it out and eat the same foods, then they would succeed as long as they eat less than them. And it's like, that's not necessarily possible. There are people who will struggle to control their portions with these things, at least initially. And for that person, eating a quote-unquote clean diet or a stereotypically healthy diet for the for a significantly higher percentage of the time than is promoted by flexible diets might be a really good idea. Um, like, oftentimes people can't even have biscuits in the house without eating the whole packet. So it's irresponsible to tell that person that all you need to do is just weigh out, so make sure you've only got two biscuits, and then you can still lose weight, because then they're going to do that, then they're going to eat the rest of the packet, and then they're going to fail again. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I understand the position, because it is... It's a fitness industry backlash against clean eating, yeah. which was this idea where you have to eat really clean all the time. So as always happens within human nature, especially on social media, where everyone's kind of free to say whatever the hell they want because you can just block people that disagree with you, um, they go to the extreme. So to rebel against clean eating, they will eat a box of cereal every day just to sort of say, look, here, I can do this. Um, but the truth always kind of lies in the middle. And for people who aren't able to control their intake that well, it's just a bad message. Um, and as well, people who are severely overweight, which is like the people that really health and fitness industry, the health and fitness industry should focus on those people. Yes, there are athletes, there are people in shape who coaches should focus on, but the industry in general should, in my opinion, focus on the general public because that's what we're there for. Um, and those people have been eating in an unrestricted fashion for a really long time. Like, they're ready for restriction. Some amount of dietary restriction for that person is okay. It's okay to tell them that, no, for maybe the next month or so, maybe just don't have a takeaway. Just don't. Mm. You, we, you could fit it in your macros. Of course you could. Later, we'll teach you how to do that. But for now, just stick to these whole foods because we need to completely overhaul your entire approach to dieting. And I think that is a more valuable message than just weigh your Chinese and eat less of it. Mm. Which isn't going to happen, because then there's loads no. of things like, well, I'm not going to waste it, I'll just have a little bit more, then you have a taste for it, the chances are you might have been hungry and you ended up eating quickly, and then you don't have a hunger signal to tell you that you're actually full when you're not, and then you overeat. And mm. I, I know this all too well, well because we're currently doing Fat Loss for Life, which is my group coaching programme, and the amount, we've, we've literally spent the first week talking about food environment, because mm. everyone's found that they've they've got to go f whole hog, they've they've got yeah. to not have this stuff in the fridge. You know, we've had so many stories throughout the week where people have gone, oh, someone offered me, um, you know, a cookie, and I had I had four. You know, I, I yeah. couldn't stop at one. I had four because four was on offer to me, and that is my environment. That is my norm. That is what everyone else is around me doing. And I've had to say to a lot of people. And a lot of people in the group have, you know, said, right, I'm, I'm going alcohol free. I'm stopping drinking because I can't have one. Like, mm. you know, I will keep going, especially if my husband or my friends or whatever are having one. And, you know, I, I tell people that you have to change the environment and then look how the environment can change to you long term. So mm. when you've got close to your goals and you, you started to experience what these changes bring to you, then we start to learn about, OK, can we have one beer? Can we have a packet of crisps? Is it is it within us, and do we know a rational reason um, to kind of put in place to have that stop mechanism? Because at the moment we have no rational stop mechanism. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the people who promote really, really, really flexible dieting and who often shout down those who promote a more whole foods approach, in general, I'm speaking in generalizations, of course. Um, they're the people who have been stung by restrictive dieting in the past. You, how many times have you read the story, oh, I used to eat really clean and it never really worked for me. Either It's either that I ate really clean and I couldn't manage to lose as much weight as I want because I always binged, or I ate really clean and I got in phenomenal shape and I couldn't retain it because I binged. Therefore, now I promote flexible dieting and you can do it too. Like That is the, that is the story. But I think... <clears throat> I think that while there's a lot of validity in that, um, especially for people who work with competitors, for people who work with people already in the fitness industry, perhaps people who've already tried the whole clean eating thing a bunch of times, like there's a lot of value in that. But I think if you speak to people outside of the fitness industry, 
they're not under the impression that you have to eat clean all the time. So for, for you to then say, oh, you don't have to restrict things, they're like, I know. Like, my Weight, Watch, my, <laughs> yeah. like my, my weight Watchers person says that already. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I need you to teach me how to eat better. Yeah. And I think, like, they're not... A small amount of restriction is fine. That's kind of the point I want to make. And because a lot of restriction has led some people to develop issues around food, which are, I don't want to downplay that in the slightest. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen to everyone. And that doesn't necessarily mean that people should be afraid to recommend moderate amounts of restriction for given periods of time when someone's first starting out, having been eating an unrestricted diet for 10 years, now they're overweight and that's why they've got a coach in the first place. Mm. We had an episode a while ago where we spoke about um, the background because you and me brought up background, bias and context at the beginning of this. And the topic came up of um, Lane Norton and his background of, of coaching and my background of coaching. It's literally the polar opposite. So mm. you're right in saying that Lane Norton deals with an awful lot of people that have orthorexic behaviour around a clean diet and that is disempowering their long-term adherence to a goal because they feel that everything that passes their lips has to be 100% quote-unquote clean. So his yeah. background of promotion is that he wants to enforce if it fits your macros because it gives them more balance and adherence long-term and helps with their sanity. My background Definitely. is I came from a fact that I didn't have a um, stop mechanism around all these junk foods. I ate chip sandwiches like they were going out of fashion. And when I had a, food, a diet that was literally you know, 98% quote unquote clean, I felt incredible. Like I had mm. energy for days and that's what I want other people to um, kind of feel. But not enough people stand back in fitness and go, okay, why is Lane saying this? Why is Ben saying this? Well, actually, Lane is talking to a population that needs that bit of advice. And I'm talking to a population that needs that bit of advice. And then when we come together and talk about the same group, we'll end up agreeing. Yeah, obviously. I mean, I run a, a free Facebook group for people in my local area. None of them you would ever classify as clean eaters. Like if someone posts, it, it, it's almost like a running joke. It's like if you post a healthy meal, everyone's like, yeah, where's the rest of it? It's like, because it, it's almost expected that you're going to be eating in this quote unquote flexible way. And it's like, the reason that I like having that group there to sort of guide my thought processes is because they're normal people outside of the fitness industry. I think fitness industry people, myself included, we're not normal and we once you kind of surround yourself by some, like only fitness people and then clients who perhaps, a lot of fitness, in, fitness industry folks as well, our clients are people who are on the fringe of the fitness industry, they follow other fitness professionals, especially if you coach online because most people don't even know that online PT is a thing. So if you're coaching someone via the internet, they probably already have read at least a few blogs. They probably understand at least a bit of stuff. I mean, if you talk to people who are completely removed from this industry, they don't have all of the same hang-ups and biases that a lot of people speak to. So for someone such as yourself who does speak to that population, like that's where your message has more value than I think some people give it credit for. Um, I spend all my time telling my, I spend most of my time telling people to eat vegetables. Mm. Like, I believe in flexible dieting. I know the ins and outs of glucose metabolism depending on different food, like different foods and different food sources. Um, I understand how alcohol affects the metabolic, like, affects metabolism of different nutrients to a respectable degree. That sort of means I, I understand what basically happens. I understand all of that. I could tell people, right, if you're going on a night out, let's restrict your food here, here, and here, then limit you to this many drinks, and then tomorrow we're going to do this, this, and this, and it'll all even out and it'll be fine. But I'm enough of a realist to go, they're not going to do that. <laughs> Why don't I just try to get them to eat more vegetables, eat a little bit more protein, go for a walk, and then we can dial in the specifics once they've already made those habits because they're already better. They're already healthier. They've already lost a bit of weight, and they've already started to develop the kind of habits that we can then mould into a more long-term, flexible approach. Mm. Thomas, we've just uh, rambled on for literally an hour on question number one. Um, yeah. Some might say this could be a podcast duo made in heaven. Yeah. Let's 
not do that then. <laughs> like, <laughs> we should probably get a little bit more on topic. I do promise the listeners that I'm not always totally rambly, and yeah. I can often make a point in less than 10 minutes. This is, this is where the best <laughs> stuff happens. Discussions, you know, we've just opened every angle of this discussion. It's really important. We've, we've debated it from different angles. We've looked at our own biases. We've looked at our own, you know, backgrounds. We've put a context on top. We've used different examples of the fitness industry. And I think that's really important because it's like, you know, my tour at the moment, I'm teaching this four hour seminar and I stand there and say to people, I will not, I will not tell you do this, do that. The broccoli does this and chicken does that. I will give you all the facts and then I'll talk about you as a person. I'll give you an understanding of how to look at your own context, environment, belief systems, and how that is going to fit. And you make your own plan. You make your own diet. You find out whether you want to weight train three days a week or five days a week or you enjoy cardio. Like I'm going to try and give you the life skills to build your own nutrition plan. And it's kind of really what we've done today. It's given people enough context to go, do you know what, I'm that guy and I think mm. I need to do this despite what X, Y, and Z says. Yeah. So I think we should probably like sum up our position on the actual question just so the listener gets an answer. <laughs> and then and then we'll call it there. So I think realistically, if you're replacing one meal a day with liquid nutrition, it's probably not a bad idea. Ideally, you would probably make it yourself because then you're going to use a protein source that may be better or whatever. I mean, if you want to use pea and rice, that's fine. But then you can add in some whole fruits, some milk, all of these things that have got nutrients in them. That's fine. I would then, however, probably look to make sure you get the rest of your nutrition from whole foods that you cook yourself, if for no other reason than it is, as you mentioned, a nutritional life skill that's worth doing. And I'm also hesitant to say to someone, no, you're right, you definitely don't have enough time to feed yourself because I think in general that's where you can look at your schedule and just try to free up a little bit of time so that you can get into the habit of feeding yourself properly. And there's a point in time where that pa person has to value their health. If they're yes. not willing to make time for it, then how much scope do we have to help them as coaches when they will not just stand back and say, do you know what, actually I'll, ma I'll make an extra 10 minutes to cook a good breakfast. Or prepare cool. my lunch. Yeah. Right. I think we've answered that one. Yeah, you know, Thomas. Let... <laughs> um, let's let's end the show there. We'll save the next question for next time. Otherwise, we'll be here all night. I've got to go to the gym and I've got to go and get barbecue food because it's sunny outside and I'm going to have a beer and cook some meat and have it with lots of vegetables as well. Um, so... We'll end it there. Look, if you enjoyed the show, let me know. This is a new format. Tom's a new co-host. Shout us on social media. Tell us whether you liked it, what you didn't, whether we can improve it. Like, We're always here to take um, the comments and have discussion. Wherever you like to discuss it, Facebook, Twitter, um, wherever you like is awesome. Uh, if you've got a question for the podcast, email bencoomba at gmail.com with the subject line podcast. If you enjoyed the show and you would uh, be willing to leave us a review on iTunes, and that would be incredible because that helps keep getting the show noticed. We keep spreading the message to more and more people. Me and Tom will be back on the show soon. I'm very busy on tour at the moment, so I don't really know when that will be, but he will be back on the show soon. <laughs> uh, next week is, well, I don't even know. I don't even know what next week is. It might be Tom again. Who knows? <laughs> Why not? Who knows? Yeah. But Tom, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and I'll speak to you all soon. Yes, and for all you lot, stay awesome. Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number 260.